Rabbi, you say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But when exactly will it come? When you see the clouds moving from the east, you say the rain is coming. And so it is. When the desert wind blows, you say it'll be hot. And it is. All of you can read the signs of the earth and the sky. How is it you can't read the signs of the times? The kingdom of heaven is here. Now. All right, I am really excited. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while to start a brand new series on this, the first Sunday of the new year, and we're calling this Kingdom Citizenship. And this very first message is going to be called The Call to Citizenship. And I want you to find, Ma uh, not Matthew, but John chapter 3. If you find John chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8 in a minute, and we'll get to that shortly. But uh, please be with us tonight for our, our prayer service. We're going to start at 6 o'clock, praise and worship, praying into the vision for the year 2020. I'll be sharing from my heart some things that God has laid on my heart to, to share with you. Uh, and and uh, we've already said this several times, I know, but I truly am excited about a new year. 2020. Everybody say that with me. 2020. Wow. Doesn't that sound like futuristic? It, it sounds almost like a, like a, you know, something out of, a, out of a movie or something, almost like science fiction. Who would have thunk that we could ever got to the year 2020? I mean, it sounds like it's, it's incredible. Now, can I be a little um, transparent with you this morning? I started to say a little humorous, but I don't know if it will be or not. I'll let you be the judge of that. But <laughs> I can remember when I was a little guy, and I was probably a teenager or maybe even a preteen, that I began to think, and that's a long time ago, I thought, wow, what will it be like when we reach the year 2000? You know, how many remember 2000? Y2K. <laughs> the world is going to shut down. All the computers are going to freeze and, and the world is going to cease to exist. I remember when just a little guy, I thought, wow, the year 2000. And I can remember this thinking, wow. And I calculated, I did the math. When, I, when we reach the year 2000, I will be 42 years old. And I thought, wow, I'll be really, really old. That's 20 years ago. And now, now we're in 2020. I mean, who would have thought we would have gotten to this point? It sounds like it's, it's kind of like science fiction. But you know what? I'm excited about 2020. I'm going to be a grandpa in 2020. Have you heard about that? That's going to be exciting. I'm going to be the best looking, the most handsome, the most vigorous, athletic. And this little lady up in the second row is going to be the most beautiful, the most uh, adoring grandma you've ever seen. I mean, we're excited about what God is going to do for us. New year. New attitude. New expectations, new desires, new faith, new confidence. I started to say new dream. It's kind of like really it's the same old dream, but it's a new expectation to see it fulfilled. That's why I'm launching today this series called Kingdom Citizenship that I've been looking forward to for some time. I loved our Christmas series. We did the Christmas series in the five Sundays of December, and I love the gifts that God gave. But my calling, my passion is really to teach a series like this one that we're teachings beginning today about the kingdom. I want to teach some new things to the body of Christ. I hope to be able to share some things with you that maybe you did not know before, to think in some areas that is a little bit out of the box, to give you new paradigms, new visions, new understandings. And we're calling this kingdom citizenship. And the little tagline is the principles and power of kingdom citizenship, keys to experiencing heaven on earth. How many would like to experience a little heaven on the earth? How many would like to have a little bit of heaven before you get to heaven? How many would like to experience a little bit of the reality of the 
kingdom of heaven before you go to the location called heaven. And I'm going to start asking you to pray with me that God will bring the culture of heaven down to Spring Hill, Florida. The Bible tells us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've said this many times. You could put anything in this sentence, but there's no sickness in heaven. So let's believe that God will bring wholeness on the earth. There's no depression in heaven. Let's ask that God will bring a fresh measure of hope in the people's lives in the year 2020. There's no cancer in heaven. There's none of that stuff in heaven. So let's ask God to invade the culture on earth with the presence of, of heaven. And in this message, it's kind of an introductory message today. I just want to do some teaching. I really have a hunger and a desire to be a teacher to the body of Christ. I really believe that one of the things that sets family first apart, and I'll get to the message in a minute, but I really intend this series to be different. I'm going to be a teacher in this series. You can see I've got a little different microphone. I don't have my, my preaching prophetic microphone. I just have the lapel mic because I want to talk to you. And I've discovered that when I use this type of a microphone and communicate in this manner, I, I'm not so preachy. I'm a little bit more teachy. I didn't say techy. I said teachy, treachy, whatever. Uh, but it's a little more conversational. It's a little bit more dialogue. And I really want to get you to come into an understanding with me about some things that you have maybe never considered before. And this is in the area of what sets family first apart. I really believe we're not in a comparison. I've said this many times. There's many great churches in this community. We're not in comparison or competition with any of them, but we do have a unique vision. There's a kingdom vision in this house. There's a kingdom message in this house. There's a kingdom revelation in this house. And if you don't understand everything I'm saying in this introduction, I pray that it will be apparent to you as we go along. And to be frank and honest with you, if you've got a desire to learn new things, to grow, if you're wanting in the year 2020 to take your spiritual life to a new area of understanding and revelation and, and presence and power of God, I think you're going to be thrilled in this journey. If you're looking for business as usual, if you're looking to come to church to get a feel-good feeling, if you're looking to come to go through a routine of religion and just experience the same old emotional high that you get that doesn't last till Tuesday afternoon, you're probably going to get disappointed. Come on, I'm preaching a lot better than you're shouting right now. But if you're going to pack in with me and learn some things in these next few weeks, I really believe God will touch that little baby in the name of Jesus. Help him, Lord. Whatever's going on there. I really believe God is really going to help us. So how many will listen as I teach? How many will take some notes? If I work hard to put this stuff together, the least you can do is write it down. Come on, somebody. That's a pretty good word. I've got stuff on the YouVersion Bible app. Download it on your phone. You don't even have to write it. Just download it. It's already typed out for you. But I want to talk about keys to experiencing heaven on earth. And to talk about the kingdom, we have to start with a basic understanding of the kingdom. So what is the kingdom? You say, well, pastor, everybody understands what the kingdom is. All churches teach the kingdom, the, the, the kingdom of God. Everybody knows what the kingdom of God is. Nobody needs to explain. And we say, oh, it's all about just getting people to heaven because it's the kingdom of heaven. Well, yes and no. There's a lot more to it than that. So I want to unpack for you, and we did this a few years ago. I think it was in 2018. Many of you are new, but we did a vision casting message at that time called Kingdom Culture. And so I want to lay the foundation here again. In order to understand kingdom citizenship, you have to understand the kingdom and what it means to be a citizen of that kingdom kingdom. Because here's what Jesus said, and you found John chapter 3 a minute ago, and I'm going to get to that in a moment, so just hold steady. But in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God. You must experience the kingdom of God. If you experience it, then you'll see it. But if you try to see it first, you'll never experience it. How many know what earthly culture says? Earthly culture says you've got to see it 
to believe it. How many have ever heard somebody say, if I see it, I believe it. Seeing is believing. That's earthly philosophy. Earthly philosophy is you have to see it to believe it. Seeing is believing. Seeing is experiencing. But kingdom culture philosophy says experiencing is seeing. Uh, it's better caught than taught. It's better experienced than it is understood. And so when Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, the first thing that's got to happen is you've got to experience the kingdom of God so then you can see what you're experiencing. I can't paint you a picture. I, I can't say, here's what the kingdom's all about, and I know you've never experienced this, but here's how beautiful it is. Now, why don't you come and experience it with me? I can't do that. That's backwards. But I've got to say, if you will experience the kingdom, if you'll step into the kingdom, if you'll experience the favor of God that starts by the entrance of salvation into the kingdom, then you'll look back into your life weeks or months or years afterwards and you'll say, wow, this is an amazing experience because now I'm walking as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So let me give you a definition. A kingdom, now that's a small letter K, a kingdom of any kind is the governing influence of a king over a territory impacting the territory with his will, the king's will, his purpose, and his intent, producing a culture and a moral standard for the citizens. Now that's a generic, secular definition of a kingdom. But the very best picture or example of a kingdom that we're going to understand today is the kingdom of God. So let's say, what is the kingdom of God? Or what is the kingdom of heaven? And I'll explain that in a little bit. Those are synonymous terms. Whatever Bible version, whatever language is used, it's always talking about the same kingdom. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of Jesus, kingdom of Christ. What Whatever, whatever way it is explained, it's all the same kingdom. And what is the kingdom of God? Well, let's start with some statements. Number one, the kingdom of God starts with God because God is the king. Yes. Say that with me. God is the king. Someone said there's two revelations everybody needs to understand. Number one, there is a God. Number two, you're not him. <laughs> there is a God. God is king. He is large and he is in charge. He is sovereign. He is ultimate. He is invincible. He is not a president. He's not a prime minister. He's not a dictator. He's not a politician. He's a king. He was not elected. His rule and his will will never end and he cannot be impeached. <laughs> Come on, somebody. He does not answer to anyone. He cannot be taken out by anyone. He answers to himself. He writes the rules. He enforces the rules. He ordains the rules. He is God. He is the king. Now, if we can't get past that, we'll not get anywhere. But that's the first statement. Here's the second one. The king, which is God, has a kingdom. He has a dominion. That's the territory, the area, the place where his rule and authority is in effect. Now, this citizenship culture statement is important because a kingdom is a place where someone called a king has a dominion over something. If someone thinks they're a king and they don't have any dominion, they don't have any territory, they don't have any area of ownership and rule and reign, they're not really a king. They're just a wannabe. They're just an imaginary. But the king, our God, the king has a dominion. He has a territory. And uh, we'll talk about God's kingdom because there is no area outside of that rule. When you talk about God's kingdom, where is God's kingdom? Or what is God's kingdom? Everything is God's kingdom. There is nothing that is outside of the rule and the reign of the authority of God. God is in control of not only the heavens, but he is the earth. And that's why, let me just explain this now. Throughout the series, you'll hear these terms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and they're synonymous terms. Because the Bible calls it the kingdom of God, meaning it's of God, it's from God, it's owned by God, he is the king of the kingdom, but it's also called the kingdom of heaven, to help us understand that it's heavenly in its very nature and its very design. Now, this is the first point that we're really going to tread some deep waters here this morning. The kingdom of heaven is not referring to a kingdom that exists in a place 
somewhere up in the sky or somewhere off of this planet called heaven. And we say, well, the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom that is in this place called heaven. No, the kingdom of heaven is wherever the heavenly kingdom is established, whether it's up there or whether it's down here, because it's the rule and reign of God. And this is one of the first things that you really have to pack into your understanding. And it was emphasized on the video. Jesus said in John chapter or Matthew chapter three, the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. Remember that? Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, if something is at hand, what does that mean? Does that mean, oh, someday it might hopefully be here? It, it's at hand, so someday prayerfully it'll come. Someday when I die and I go to heaven and I, I see Jesus, then I'll be in the kingdom. No, if something is at hand, it's, it's, it's in my hand. It's, it's at hand. It's tangible. The, these keys are at hand. They're, they're tangible. I can hold them. I can open doors with them. I can do things with these keys because they are at hand. And if the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that's that means it's not up there waiting for me someday when I die, I'll go and I'll be in the kingdom called heaven because that's a location. No, the kingdom of heaven means that I have opportunity to experience it today, to right now where I'm at because it's not a location. It is an experience of the rule and the reign of God and it can be up there but can also be down here. Why would Jesus tell us to pray, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven if it's impossible to reach up by faith and get a hold of something up there and pull it down here. He would have been telling us to do something it would be impossible to do. He wouldn't give us an instruction without an ability to fulfill that. So when he gave us that mandate to pray, he's implying automatically that it's possible to experience heaven on earth. It's possible to experience heaven before you get to heaven. It's possible to have the rule and the reign of God over your life because because kingdom of heaven is not a location, but it's an environment where the presence of God rules and reigns and it wants to happen here on the earth. I want the kingdom to come in Spring Hill, Florida. I want the king to be established in Hernando County. I want the king to be established in family first. I want to pray thy kingdom come in Hernando as it is in heaven because the kingdom is wherever the rule and the reign of the king takes its place of authority. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. So there's a king. The king has a dominion number three. And this is where we break down analogies with other types of governments or political entities. The king, which is in this case God, owns everything. This is another reason why we celebrate that the king, God, is not like a president. He's not like a governmental leader. He's not a political leader because the leaders of our country I hope this is a revelation to somebody, especially when you get ready to go to the ballot voting ballot box later this year. They don't own our country. Come on, somebody get with me. They don't tell us what to do. Because in America, we have a democracy. Technically, America is a representative democracy, which is, how many remember the eighth grade? Remember your civics lesson that the Constitution says the American government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. We own the country. The country doesn't own us and tell us what to do. Come on. I, I don't make me stay on this a little while. This country will be what we make it in the next number of years. This country will be what we vote. This country will be what we enforce. Nothing happens on the earth that the church doesn't either initiate by its jurisdictional spiritual authority or allow to happen by its uh, inability to influence. And we've got a mess on our hands right now in the American culture because for many generations, the church has sat back and not done anything. And we've went to, to see uh, uh, this, this country go to hell in a handbasket. And we've said, by, well, I don't know how this happened. I'll tell you exactly how it happened. Preachers stop preaching preaching the truth, people stopped responding and living out and we stopped voting and we stopped influencing and we stopped putting people in government that were people of Christian ethics and principles and now we've sown under the wind and we've reaped the whirlwind. I told you I wasn't going to get all preachy so I might have to strap on that other microphone or slow myself down. Come on somebody. <laughs> all right. But a king owns everything. That's why God is not like 
a politician. He owns everything. The king owns everything in the kingdom. Every single part of the kingdom is the king's personal property. The Bible says, Haggai 2.8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. Not just the money, but look at this. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and those who dwell therein. Everything in the kingdom is the personal property of the king. It's his. Every mountain, every road, all the animals, the plants, the food, the water, everything. No king can claim rulership unless he possesses some territory. In fact, the glory of a kingdom is always determined by the size of that king's territory. That's why kings are always wanting to expand their territory because no king wants to have a shrinking territory. They want it to expand. And the kingdom of heaven is the greatest kingdom on the earth because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And then notice what it says in the byline of this verse, and those who dwell therein. That even means that the king owns the people that are bought with a price. No, you're not. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You are bought with the price. If you're saved and if you have Jesus in your life, you are the ownership of God. God paid the price to have you as his child. He is the king. He is the sovereign. He is the ruling authority over your life. You belong to the Lord. But the amazing thing is the king, which is God, welcomes people into his kingdom and they become citizens. So you and I are the citizens. We are the, the subjects, if you will. We, we are the people that make up the kingdom of which our God, the King, is our ruler and our Lord. And we are his people. We are his subjects. We are his very own people. Now, this is why in the future, as we get into this series, I'm going to move on into the fact that so many people have never moved into full rights and privileges of citizenship. And that's how we're going to understand how to bring heaven to earth, how to experience heaven on earth is by exercising all of our rights and privileges as citizens of the citizenship of the kingdom of heaven. But we also have to understand that there is a counter kingdom. You see, the Bible says there is a kingdom of light and what? Kingdom of darkness. There is the kingdom of God, and there is the kingdom of Satan or Lucifer. And we have to understand there is another kingdom. So look at this. There is a reason. I love this. I want to teach you something here in a minute. There's a reason why we call the kingdom of God the kingdom of light and the kingdom of Satan the kingdom of darkness. I want you to look at that screen really close. I just want to point out something. And my computer kept automatically trying to correct it, and I had to override it. I had to put into the database, stop trying to capitalize Satan's name. He doesn't deserve a capital S. It's a small letter S. His kingdom does not deserve a capital letter K. It's a small letter K. So the kingdom of God is a large letter G, and it's a large letter K. But the kingdom of Satan is a small letter K, and it's a small letter S, because we have one kingdom of light... And we have one kingdom of darkness. And this is what I learned this week. I tell you what, it's amazing when you learn things and then I get to come and I tell you all these people these things and you think that I just dreamed this stuff out of the clear blue sky and you don't really know that I read it in a book. But the amazing thing is you could read it in books too if you had an appetite to, to learn things like that, if that didn't get over your head. But here's what is amazing. In the Hebrew, the same word for darkness can be translated ignorance. Now turn to your neighbor and say, did he just call me stupid? No, I said that the same word for darkness can be translated ignorance. Now, in the Greek and Hebrew, the same word that is translated light in its root form can also be translated knowledge. So, so what, what is this telling us? It is telling us that the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of 
ignorance is founded upon people's ignorance of the fact that the only real power or the only real dominion Satan has is what they have voluntarily given to him or yielded to him, surrendered to him because actually they're ignorant and he wants to keep them in the darkness and the darkness is the ignorance of the fact that he doesn't really have any authority over their lives. He has just tricked them and made them think he does, but the kingdom of God is not founded on darkness darkness, which is ignorance. It is founded on light, which is knowledge and revelation. So the more we know of this kingdom that we're a part of, the more the light of the glory of God. Oh, come on, somebody help me with this Baptist church here this morning. The more of the light that comes into my life is going to give me greater revelation. I'm going to walk in greater victory because now I'm not dying because of lack of revelation. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. No, I'm not destroyed for lack of knowledge. I'm being more than a conqueror because of the knowledge of God that is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. And the more I know, the more the light I walk in and the more the anointing of the Spirit of God is in my life. That's why here at Family First, we're interested in learning some things. Come on, let me help you with this. Pastor Coach, why, why do you think it's so important for us to bring our Bibles to church? Because you don't know it all, that's why. Why is it so important for us to listen when you preach? I just love to hear the inspiration. I just love to see you come and get red in the face. That'll last you till about 3 o'clock this afternoon. But Tuesday night, when all hell breaks forth in your life, you would love to be able to say, I wish I could remember what Pastor said. I wish I could remember that verse he quoted. Because if I would have written that down, then I could remember it and I could use it against Satan. But you just had the thrill of the moment. And after the moment was over, you weren't ready for the battle that was going to take place 36 hours later. That is good preaching. Thank you, sweetheart. I'll take you out for lunch for that. Now, that doesn't go for all the rest of you. Just, just her. Just Grammy. That's the only one. Just, just Grandma and I. We're going to... Make our way to, where, oh my, I'm going to get in trouble now. Just because I'm becoming a grandparent does not mean I'm going to go to Golden Corral. I'm, I'm just telling you, I, I am not going to Golden Corral. That, that's just, I, I just can't quite handle that. But anyway, all right, everybody doing okay here this morning? Say amen. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, sweetheart. The kingdom of God is not, let me just say this, it's not the opposite of the kingdom of Satan. Because God has no opposite. He has, he has something that resists him, he opposes him, but don't ever see the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan as two, as two competing entities out there. And, and you know a lot of people say, well, I've read the back of the book and we win. For Pete's sakes, why go to the back of the book? Why don't you start at Genesis 1-1 that says, In the beginning, God. And in the first verse of the first book, you know who's going to win. You don't have to go to the last verse of the last book. You start in the first verse of the first book. And know that God is large. He's in charge. He's going to win this thing. His kingdom is established in our lives by the authority of the Holy Spirit. And Satan is just an unemployed He's an alienated. He's an excommunicated. I looked this up. I guess it's not a word. Google didn't help me out. He's a decitizenized kingdom person because his citizenship was revoked. But you and I are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now get a hold of this verse. I'm going to read for you in Romans chapter 8 verse 32 in a moment. But citizens of the kingdom have unlimited resources available to them because the king has given them all things. If the king owns everything, my king owns everything. I don't know about your king, but my, king, my king's not suffering. We don't take offerings on Sunday morning because our king is out of money. Come on, I'll help you with this. We don't receive tithes and offerings here at this church because God's kingdom is broke. No, God's doing quite well. I don't know if you've looked in the book of Revelation yet, but he takes purest, finest gold that is worth astronomical amounts of money and he paves the streets with it because that's how wealthy and extravagant he is in his design. We don't take offerings for God's benefit. We take them for our benefit. Because that gives us the ability to schedule the favor of God's in our lives. Because if we give, God will give back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, full and running over. Shall men, not God, but other people give into your bosom. We need to read our Bible because we're destroyed for lack of knowledge. But God, the Bible says in Romans 8.32, if you just go have, I'll stand down here for a second. 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us just a little bit to get by? Thank you, Maria. Bless your heart. I know the rest of you are just thinking too fast to respond. But isn't that the way most people think? Oh, Lord, just give me a little bit. I just want to get by. Just build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. I just want to survive. I just want to get... Oh, I don't expect anything down here. I don't expect to help anybody down here because I don't have a vision to help anybody. If I had a vision to help anybody, then God would give me provision. But since I don't have any vision to help anybody, I'm not in need of any provision because I don't know what I'd do with it anyway. I'd just bank it and, and not do anything valuable with it. And I'm preaching over the people's heads and I can feel the, the anger carton to come out right now. That's why I got my eyes closed. But I'm going to open my eyes in a minute and we're going to get into a different subject. But God graciously does does what? Gives us all things. Why? You want to look at the next verse? How many want to stir up some religious devils here this morning? I love to stir up the demons. Look at this next verse. 1 Timothy 6, 17. This is a similar statement, but look at the very end. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Now this verse is not to beat up on rich people. I believe this verse, obviously. We charge them not to be haughty. No honestly wealthy kingdom person has a haughty spirit. They don't set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. They still keep their hopes on God. Who does what? Who richly provides us with everything to be miserable. And that's the way most Christians would read that verse. God just gives me just enough to get by. Just a little bit. So I can be miserable the rest of my life. Did I ever tell you about the story? This pastor, he was old school. And in the early service, a lot of old school people in the early service. Maybe not quite as many in this service. How many are old school? How many are raised? Old line. I mean, old, old style. All this, the idea that if it's, if it's uh, fun, it's sin. You know, big, big bun, no fun. Any, anything that's enjoyable has got to be wrong, you know. And, and so this guy, was, he was a preacher, and he was training his little son. They were out traveling the countryside, and they're driving by this mansion, they're in their beat up jalopy and it's backfiring as they're going down the road and you know the windows are broken out and it's they're riding along and this guy says son you see that mansion over there and the little boy says yeah he said it's a big mansion i mean they got tennis courts they've got volleyball courts they've got swimming pools there's a um, pasture out in the back with horses and the, the wealthy landowner's children are riding the, and, and it's just phenomenal and the, and the, the uh, religious guy says son you see that mansion over there and the little boy says yeah daddy I see that he says son those people are miserable they're miserable they've got money they've got all kinds of stuff but they're miserable and the little boy looked at his daddy and said well daddy if they're really miserable, they're hiding it pretty well. <laughs> but that's old school philosophy. God wants us to be miserable. God does, and this, this verse irritates the fire out of religious spirits. Because God, who is rich, wants to give us riches with everything to enjoy. It's okay to enjoy the favor of what God gives you. Come on, am I preaching pretty good here this morning? Say, praise the Lord. But our king owns everything, and so he lets us experience the wealth of his kingdom so that we can do kingdom work. Now, I'm really trying to stay in this teachy thing this morning. I'm, I'm open for some input from you if I'm going to be able to stick with this gig for the next several weeks of this series. I don't know if we'll make it or not. But let me give you some terms. Let me just quickly break down some thoughts because there's some traditions, some beliefs, some ideas, and some paradigms that got to be exposed because there's some things that restrict many Christians' understanding of the kingdom. The first word we have to deal with is the word religion. The kingdom of God ha has almost nothing to do with religion. I know it sounds religious. We say it's the kingdom of 
God. <laughs> and we have to pronounce it like it's spelled G-A-W-D. It's a last, last over voice from last October from Halloween. It's the kingdom of God. And it sounds very religious. Or we say it's the kingdom of heaven, and that sounds very religious. But in all reality, the kingdom of God has nothing to do with religion. Has really nothing to do with tradition. Jesus taught that there's only one thing that can destroy the power of the word of God. Look up your Bible. It's the traditions of man. That's the only thing that has, can make the power of the word of God null and void. Your tradition. So religion is not the same as the kingdom. Now I said this a while ago, but let me just repeat it. Heaven is not the same as the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven. Now listen to me. If you missed it a while ago. The kingdom of heaven has very little to do with the place that I am going to go to, ultimately, that's called heaven. I'm going to go to heaven. Not today that I'm aware of. But soon, or I mean not soon, but someday. <laughs> not real soon, but someday I'm going to go to heaven. However, I don't have to wait till I go to heaven to experience this thing called the kingdom of heaven. Are you with me? Because... The kingdom of heaven doesn't just exist in that place called heaven. It happens and exists wherever the heavenly culture, the nature and the design of God's rule and reign is established on the earth. That's why Jesus said, you saw from the video, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is here. It is now. So it's not a religious thing. It's not necessarily a heaven thing as if going to heaven. And this one might be a little more difficult for us. It's really not the same thing as the church. A lot of people say, oh, the kingdom of God. Yeah, the kingdom of heaven. Oh, yeah, I understand that. that that's the church. No, the church and the kingdom are not the same thing. Not necessarily. The kingdom was here a long time before the church ever came into existence. When did the church come into existence? On the day of Pentecost, the church was birthed in the upper room as the early church was filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they went out into the streets to, to be a witness of the gospel. But the kingdom was here a long time before the church came into existence, and the kingdom will be here a long time after the church is no longer on the earth. One of these days we'll be raptured. We'll be in the presence of God forever. And I don't want to meddle with anybody's theology here this morning, so I'll say it briefly. But if you really understand the teaching of Scripture, the church will no longer be necessary after the end times because the word church is the assembly of called out faithful believers. And if we're the assembly of called out ones, when we're no longer on the earth, when we're in heaven, when we're in an environment where the only people that are in that environment are godly, righteous, holy people. God won't need a quote unquote church. He won't need an assembly of called out ones because everyone will be called in. Are you with me? So the word, and I know Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. What he meant was the church will never fail. The church will fail. I mean, the church will never fail. It will be successful in its mission. And once its mission is completed, it will be fulfilled and we won't go to a place called heaven. We'll go to the new Jerusalem and will be in that place as the participants of the kingdom of God. Now, does that mean the church is important? Absolutely. The church is important. Have I given my life to the church? Absolutely. Look at this statement. All of my life, I have given to the building of the church. However, the church is really only the entry point into which that which is so much bigger and greater, which is the kingdom. So with all that said, I want you to find John 3. And I'll do this in just a few minutes. I want to read these verses and I'll make three statements. Turn to your neighbor and say, well, how long can it take to make three statements for Pete's sakes? But look at this, John chapter 3. Go ahead and find it. If you don't have your paper Bible, pull out your phones. Just don't text me right now. Don't look me up on social media because there's a thing called a timestamp. It amazes me what people do on social media. Uh, can I just vent for a second? I'm not asking for permission. I'm just telling you it's coming. Pastor, I'm sick today. I won't be at church. Three hours later, their pictures show up 
there at Bush Gardens. Come on, I mean, don't you people know I have a brain? If you're gonna, if you're gonna, you know, go to Bush Gardens, tell me you're gonna go to Bush Gardens. Don't just tell me you're sick and then show up at Bush Gardens. I mean, that, that just anyway. Uh, just, just say it. All right, John chapter three. Pray for me, sweetheart. Don't just sit there and giggle. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night, and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. For the wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Very familiar passage. What's the context? What's the subject? What's the uh, context of the passage? It's talking about salvation. Yes, it's talking about being born again. It's talking about experiencing transformation in your life. But what is Jesus really talking about? He's talking about the kingdom. And he's talking about how to experience the kingdom. He said, no one can see the kingdom unless he experiences the rebirth, the regeneration, the born again experience, because that's the doorway. That's the opening through which you get into the kingdom. And that's how you fundamentally then become a part of the kingdom. So I want to break this down and give you three statements this morning. I'll just do it quickly. And this could have been expanded for a long time, but I can give it to you quickly. Citizenship in the kingdom is fundamentally different than membership in a religious entity. Now here's how we have traditionally read John chapter 3. Just a couple minutes, stay with me. Here's what we've traditionally read. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Nicodemus says, Jesus, I've been watching you and your disciples. I, I really like your group. I, I really like what you're doing. I, I've really been impressed by your church. So I want to join up. So how do I get in? What's the membership path? How do I get into membership of the group? And Jesus says what? You must be born again. Now that message of being born again is absolutely essential. It's obviously very, very critical and that's the only way we see the kingdom of God. But Nicodemus wasn't asking really how I can become a member of your group. He was asking how can I experience the miracles of heaven on earth? How can I experience the sovereign reign and rule that I see being demonstrated in the life of your disciples? How can I experience a life that is bigger and better than the life I'm... He, he wasn't asking for membership in their club. He was asking for citizenship in their kingdom because he saw the power and the anointing that was functioning in their lives, people uh, being delivered and healed and the blind, uh, eyes opening and the deaf hearing and, and people being raised from the dead. So, so listen to this, while membership in a religious institution may make you a member of that group, citizenship of the kingdom is what grants you the full rights and privileges of citizenship in the kingdom of God. And while Jesus was talking about being born again, what he was really saying is there must be total life's transformation. If you want to see the kingdom, you've got to stop being who you used to be and start being who God wants you to be. Stop living the life you lived. Stop being who you used to be and being the whole new person that God wants you to be because you are born again. You're made new. You're regenerated. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And you do that not to become a member of a group, 
Not to get a membership card at Family First or even to say, well, I'm a member of the universal body of Christ because I'm born again. No, you don't do it for membership. You do it for citizenship so that you can experience all the rights and the privileges and the blessings and the favors of of the kingdom that are available to you because you've experienced the transformation of the rulership of God over your life. Are you with me? And so many people are content with membership. And I'm not saying church membership at a particular church, although that could apply. They're content with salvation, but they've never moved up to full rights and privileges of citizenship. Because your membership in a religious group might change. Now, just give me a few minutes here. It's very serious stuff. You might get your feelings hurt. You might decide, well, I just don't want to be here anymore. You might want to go to another colony. You might want to shift around and and where you're at and think, well, maybe there's a better group of people that I should be at. And your feelings might not be met in every place. But if you accommodate your feelings and make decisions in your spiritual life based on what's going to impact your feelings because you want to feel like you're a member of a particular group, what you're going to miss out is the understanding that true citizenship will enable you to dominate over your feelings. And like we preached back at the Thanksgiving season, you can be like the psalmist in Psalm 103 where he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and I'm going to command my soul. I'm not going to allow my feelings feelings to dominate me, but I'm going to dominate over my feelings. I'm not going to make spiritual decisions based on felt needs. I'm going to make spiritual decisions based on kingdom instruction, and I'm going to come into covenant relationships because God is going to establish me that even my feelings and my emotions and my felt needs and all of my humanness, whether it gets met or not, sometimes I'm not going to feel it, but I'm still going to experience it because my feelings are not dependent upon my kingdom citizenship in the kingdom of the living God. You understand how that works? And so citizenship, I don't have to feel anything to be a citizen. I don't have to get up in the morning and feel all thrilled to be a Floridian. I don't have to get up and be, although I am, amen, especially when I look on the news and I see all that snow going on up north. But I don't have to, I don't have to feel anything to be a citizen. I have to feel something to be a member. I have to feel wanted. I have to feel loved. I have to feel treasured. I have to feel like all of my, all of my little needs are being catered to. And if all my little needs are not being catered to, then I get my feelings hurt. And I don't feel anything anymore. I don't need any of that because I'm a citizen. Come on, are you getting a hold of this? And all the rights and the privileges of citizenship are available to me because I live by rules and laws of God. And it's a legal declaration over me, not an emotional inclusion into a particular group of people. Come on, that's pretty good right there. It's a, it's a legal declaration declared over me, not something that's based on my feelings or my emotions. Here's the second thing. Citizenship is a work that can only be accomplished by the person of the Holy Spirit. Verses 5 through 8, I'll not read them. They basically say that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. The wind blows where it listed. So it is with everyone that is born of the Spirit. What Jesus is saying, answering Nicodemus' question, is the only way that a person can experience this sovereign life transformation is by a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. You can't be educated into the kingdom. You can be trained into membership. You can be welcomed into membership. You can be granted membership by man. But the only way you can be blessed with citizenship is by the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. Look at this verse. This is Colossians chapter 1. He, that is Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Only the Holy Spirit can deliver a person from the kingdom of darkness and transfer them into the kingdom of God. Because it's not by might, not by power, but by my Holy Spirit. 
We cannot grant people citizenship into the kingdom without the work of the Holy Spirit. We can make them a member of the church. We can make them a member of our group. But only the Holy Spirit can transfer them into citizens of the kingdom. And I could linger here, but I just want to say this quickly. This is a point at the very root of who we are as a church. Because we can have all the best programs in the world. We can be the best organized. We can be highly marketed and attract a great crowd of people. We can give them membership in our group. We can make everybody feel special. We can meet all their social and emotional needs so that they've got friends and activities and events and social needs and everything else. We can make the church so fun that everybody in town wants to come and be a part of our club. But we cannot do anything to transfer them to darkness into light from hell into heaven apart from the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's not by might or power power, but by his Holy Spirit. Now, I said this in the earlier service, it's just take me a second. Years ago, and I'm not commending this idea, I'm just saying this as an analogy, we used to say, well, you must experience the kingdom. And when you get your life all fixed up, when all your hangups and all your problems, and how many old school Pentecostals I have in the room. You, you got to make sure that you don't smoke anymore and you don't drink anymore. And you got to make sure that your life is all fixed up. You know, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't chew, you don't run around with girls that do. And when you get, when you get all that stuff fixed up in your life, when, when you're perfect like the rest of us, then come and we'll let you join our church. Well, that, I'm not commending that. that that's wrong. Nobody can be delivered if they don't have people walking out their deliverance with them. And we need to catch the fish and let Jesus clean them. That's fishing with Jesus. We catch them, he cleans them. I like that. I never like to clean fish anyway. I'll leave leave that to somebody else. But now what's happened in the church. How many love me? I'm just asking. Now what's happened in the church as we have swung to the opposite extreme. And here's the philosophy. Oh, just come and join our church. You'll fit right in. In fact, you'll feel like you've been here for all your life. We'll include you. We'll welcome you. We'll give you a place of leadership. We'll put you in charge of this ministry. We'll meet all the felt needs in your life. And this will be a wonderful home for you to feel like you are just a member of our club and everything will be wonderful. And that's all well and good. But often it doesn't go far enough. Because no matter what we do, they can experience membership with us. But apart from the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit, we cannot transfer them from darkness unto light except for a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. That's why here at Family First, the Holy Spirit will always be at the forefront of everything that we do. We want to do everything with excellence. We don't any want anyone to feel overlooked or, 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 or uh, unimportant or unappreciated, but we don't want all of that to take the precedent over the work of the Holy Spirit that says we cannot do for you what only the Holy Spirit can do for you. Why don't we find a balance that says we'll welcome you, we'll embrace you, anyone and everyone is welcome here, and we'll also take you by the hand and we'll say we'll help you walk out this relationship with God, but ultimately you've got to find that commitment in your heart to the sovereign rule and authority of the Lordship of Jesus. There's no place to heaven apart from the cross and surrender to the blood of Jesus. And if you really want to experience the kingdom of heaven, then get an advanced operation in that and start experiencing growth in your life by the sovereign outpouring of God's presence in your life today. That's that's a little bit different than, oh, let's just fill the building so we can see how many people we get here on this particular Sunday. I I got to close, I I know. I I have a tendency to just talk when I get this like a conversational approach, but am I saying anything that relates to anybody here this morning? Understand what I'm teaching today? It's, It's the kingdom, and we want to be citizens. Here's the last statement. Citizenship is not the end, it is only the beginning. Many citizens in the kingdom have never taken full advantage of all their rights and privileges of citizenship because they've never understood. They've never grown. They thought that being born again was the end when really that's just the beginning. They've said, well, yeah, born again. Yeah, John 3. I I remember. I did that once. 
I think I was like nine years old. I was in children's church. And the children's church leader said, every boy and girl that wants Jesus to come into their life, raise your hand. I remember raising my hand. I, I remember I asked Jesus in my life. I was, I was eight, nine, I was 10 years old. I remember I walked down the aisle and I, I confessed my sins at the cross, at, at the altar, and I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. The question is, what have you done since then? Because that was a wonderful beginning, but that's not the end. Because now God wants you to make, become a productive citizen of his kingdom and help pull heaven down to earth. Everybody understanding what I'm saying here this morning? So I want you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes. And I appreciate you bearing with me this morning. It's always hard to start a series. The first message in a series is the most difficult because you want to say it all not realizing that I'll have a few more weeks to unpack some of these things point by point. But I want us as a body to experience heaven on earth. And I want you to have keys implemented in your life that can help you walk out the kingdom citizenship that God has for you. But here's the starting point. Have you come through that call to citizenship by saying, Lord Jesus, I want you to be the king of my life. King of my heart, I crown you now. Be the Lord. Be the sovereign ruler. Be the king of my heart. I surrender my heart to you. I'm not the king of my life. Jesus, you are. I'm not the one making the choices and doing this thing. I'm only following your will and your purpose and your plan. And if you've done that, then that's the door into this kingdom citizenship. If you've never done that, you can do that today, asking Jesus to be the sovereign ruler and Lord of your life. Would you stand with me this morning? Everyone standing, please. I'm so excited about 2020. I'm so excited about talking to you tonight about vision praying with you tonight, doing praise and worship. And we'll all start this off at six o'clock. I hope you can come and be with us. Be a great time. We got childcare. We got nursery. Uh, we got those things going on so that everyone can participate. And Father God, today I speak there'll be a kingdom release of your blessing and your favor upon family first and the citizens of the kingdom that are in this colony called family first. I pray that there'll be signs and wonders, Lord, that will be released. I pray that there'll be supernatural miracles that will be poured out, Lord, from this place in 2020. And as we go around the community, as we go to Walmart and Publix and the grocery stores and the gas stations and everywhere we go, we're taking the kingdom with us. And I pray there will be manifestations of healings and deliverances and, and transformations of people's lives. Because the kingdom is not coming, it's here. It's within us. And wherever we go, we take it with us. And we transform the territory to the honor of our king. In Jesus' powerful and mighty sovereign name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. King of my heart, I crown you now as my Lord and as my Savior. God bless you today. Have an awesome, awesome day. We love you. We appreciate you much. We'll be looking forward to seeing you tonight. If you can possibly come and be with us at 6 o'clock, go in the grace of God's kingdom citizenship that you love. In Jesus' name, amen.